Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to the Negro, his own greatest enemy, part one. And to you, our dear viewer, this video is never intended to offend or misinform anyone. It is not also intended to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race or people. The goal is for you to look for the books journals and other materials referenced and study them yourself. Remember, the truth is still the truth even if no one knows or believes it. And from our brother Carter G. Woodson, the educated Negroes have the attitude of contempt toward their own people because in their own as well as in their mixed schools, Negroes are taught to admire the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin and the Tietan and to despise the African. And still from Carthur G. Woodson, the so-called modern education with all its defects, however, does order so much more good than it does the Negro because it has been worked out in conformity to the needs of those who have enslaved and oppressed weaker peoples. Remember in the Slave Hunters or Slave Masters Alibi series, we mentioned we are unable to make new videos at the moment but can respond to comments. Now this is due to a technical issue with one of our devices where most of the research materials are stored. So in that series, we mentioned that whoever the slave master used back then would be who he will use today, whichever way you looked at it from. And we also promised to show you how the slave trade is still sustained today. Hence our quote that the truth is still the truth even if no one knows it or believes it. Then the Negroes and how they are treated today exposes who the slave hunters of old were. So we shall in this edition try to see if we can continue to identify who the slave hunters and slave masters foot soldiers are today and we shall also respond to the comments we received from some of our previous videos. So we got this comment from one of our viewers whose name is Jay Stark and it says, in all honesty, are you really trying to educate or divide the people that make up Nigeria? So now this looks like a question, but your question should actually be, is this person suggesting that there is anything called unity in the place called Nigeria? And another question this comment would attract would be something along the lines of where was this person when people were being murdered in Nigeria? Where was this person when communities were sacked and continued to be sacked by the slave masters foot soldiers who used their guns and bullets to do it? Do you not wonder why people like this do not speak up against the killings but will speak up in favor of the killings by somehow insinuating that there is an element of unity in a place where people are being murdered in their tens of hundreds daily, even if the slave master's media does not report them or chooses to report them falsely. Those are questions we should ask before we respond to people like this, but in any case, we will still try to provide him with a response. So let us reference the slave trade in Africa in 1872, principally carried on for the supply of Turkey. Egypt, Persia, and Zanzibar by Ethian Felix Bilax and it was published in 1872 and there we are told that the Negroes however who suffer all these horrors do not lose altogether their spirit and courage but they have no arms and do not combine whilst their adversaries know how to unite when the danger is serious sometimes the blacks though under compulsion lend their aid to the brigands against the neighboring peoples please notice very well that the author was kind enough to say they do it under compulsion this is very important to note because that's why you find some negroes in the armies in those regions today that's also how some of the negroes were involved in the slave hunts because they were offered something like their freedom if you remember very well the Negroes that fought on the side of the British during the American War were freed and sent to Sierra Leone, while those that fought with the Americans were freed at some point 
and sent or rehabilitated or whatever it is in Nova Scotia and then later Liberia. This is subject of your own research. You can research it yourself so you understand what we're talking about. They are usually used as soldiers because they are considered subhuman. You may not believe us, but you research it. So going further, just to show you an element of the devastation. So when you believe somehow that it was the Negroes selling themselves, you will need to tell us how a community can sell everybody, including the seller themselves. That should tell you that there must be an external influence, an external body doing it. It's impossible based on the volume for a community to have sold itself to that level. So you see where it tells us that when Livingstone visited these countries for the first time in 1851, that's where the slave trade hadn't reached. He saw the population, men, women and children scattered over the plain engaged in agriculture and as he passed through the villages he heard the sound of mills grinding corn or workmen waving cotton. But after the slave trade visited these countries it made a complete transformation in 1861 and 1863. Livingstone no longer recognized the country which had appeared so beautiful to him. Wild beasts overran the plantations. A death-like silence hung over the villages. The doors no longer opened to proper hospitality beneath the roofs, broken in by the rain or burnt by fire, were only corpses to be seen. The chair had drifted off numbers of these bodies, which become a feast for the crocodiles. Here and there, in the middle of the reeds, born on rafts and sad remains of their dwellings, the miserable beings, when they had satisfied themselves that the passers-by were not slave hunters, lifted their pale faces and stretched out their hands for food. When the hunters were nearer, bands of fugitives might be seen gaining the woods and then would be heard the sounds of firearms, the cries of wounded and the groans of the dying. So, but our interest is to show you how the devastation was. So, the person that is talking about unity today should tell us how somebody can be talking about unity in such places where people are being murdered daily. We are not talking of weekly or yearly or biannually. We are talking of daily. If you doubt us, investigate. That the slave master does not report them in his media shows you that they know what is going on. It is as clear as they. You need to understand it. If you are not hearing from the BBC, VOA, Al Jazeera and other mainstream media about things like the killings in what is called the middle belt of Nigeria. These are in hundreds and even one person or two people killed in Europe or America or even Asia. We fly flags at half mast in support of them. But then hundreds will be murdered and it goes unnoticed. That should tell you exactly how the slave trade could have transpired or could have happened at that time. So this user that is talking of unity between those people should please explain to us how people that are dead can be united with the people that are living. That's our interest. If you can explain it to us, then we can provide you further explanations as to your question. But as it stands, your comment is out of scope. It doesn't fall in here because there is no unity in the first place. Let us also reference a history of the colonization of Africa by alien races by Sir Harry H. Johnston and it was published 1899 and there we are told that the Negro has no idea of racial affinity. He will equally align himself to the white or to the yellow races in order to subdue his fellow black or to regain his freedom from the domination of another Negro tribe. And further down which you can pause and read yourself it says and just as it would need some amazing and stupendous event to cause all Asia to rise as one man against the invasion of Europe so it is difficult to conceive that the black man will eventually form one united Negro people demanding autonomy and putting an end to the control of the white man and to the immigration settlement and intercourse of superior races from Europe and Asia so you know that very well and that's our interest to the comments that says there is anything called unity there. There is nothing like unity there.
And again, here we got this comment from one Ikechuku Onwebuna. He says, You saying a nation of Fulani, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, Tiv, Idoma, Bini, Ejo, etc., existed before the colonial era? How, as the head of this nation, so false but got some valid points? So you see how the Negro is. An average Negro, when an idea gets into his head, to eradicate it can only be by cutting the head off. He is saying there was no such nation as Nigeria before the colonialists. But this same person forgets that the name Nigeria was actually a British description of the land of the blacks and was never a name according to Flora Shaw. So now going further also, he forgets that this is where they captured the slaves from. And these appellations were created by the slave masters as divide and conquer strategy when he came in with colonization. So because what he does is he maps out a group, gives them a name so that they have a different identity. The same game they play today, if you notice in a place like Nigeria, they will create states. States that were hitherto united and one people will start fighting against themselves. You will start hearing something like, let's use the East Central State for example, or the Eastern region, there were one people. The slave master and their foot soldiers has divided them into southeast and south south. So they now fight themselves. This one will say you are not from our place. This other one will say they are not from our place. Now you go to a place like the old eastern region. They have divided them into smaller states. So each state will tell you don't marry from this other state because those states are bad. Meanwhile, the boundaries were drawn by the slave masters and his foot soldiers. So you see, that's how the brains of a Negro works. The Negro is a born slave. He doesn't believe what he reads. He doesn't even believe what he sees. He believes whatever the master is saying. However, the master says it. That's why you see them, the slave master and their foot soldiers dancing around and making some mockery of common sense in everything they do, which we shall continue to show you in our response to these comments. So for this comment, we will recommend that this user should go and do some reading and research to understand when that those appellations came into be. Igbos originally referred to all slaves from the Bight of Bini and Biafra. So you can't wake up and say, oh, these are the same people. They are just Negroes. Just as you had Negroes from the Gold Coast referred to as Chromantes and those from the other area Mandingos. However, they came up with the names, but the Negroes are the same people. What differed was who was behind the capture. Yes, they may have mixed up with other people today, but the important thing is that the Negroes couldn't have been behind the hunt, red, and capture of themselves. So today that we are seeing them doing the same thing they were doing, is incumbent on all of us to show everyone that we are actually human. So if you want to believe the lies of the slave master and their foot soldiers, it's up to you. But the important thing is that these appellations were not there originally. Yoruba did not exist any time before 1808 and it started as Yareba after the slave master had conquered that area using Dahomey. The Dahomey and Oyo's are not Negroes, but the Ibaz and the Ondo areas are Negroes. He conquered that area, mapped it out and rebaptized them as Yareba. It was around 1830 that they successfully conquered Abiokuta areas. That's how Abiokuta came to be. It was from a slave hunt. That's how the place was named as such, which will challenge you to investigate or research whichever one you choose. But let's move forward. And from the book we referenced earlier, we conclude on these little comments because we're still going to the main comment we wanted to address. And it says, the expedition avoided all display of force and was practically unarmed but it was treacherously attacked in the jungle on the way to Benin. Nearly all the native porters and all the white officers except two were massacred. One of the officers who escaped was Captain Bosaregon or whatever. These two survivors, though badly wounded and having undergone terrible hardships in the dense bush, managed to reach the village of a friendly chief. A strong expedition composed of a naval force and of Hausa soldiers. Now you believe that we are all united in your Nigeria. Note, it says naval force and of Hausa soldiers under British officers was dispatched against Benin in 1897 and after a fiercely contested struggle through the tropical jungle reached Benin city. 
which has remained ever since in the occupation of the British, the King of Benin was eventually captured and exiled to Old Calabar. Now, if you read, read this thing, you might think that they were just walking and the Benin people attacked them. That's not the case. This was a time the Benin people said they will no longer allow slaves to be marched across their kingdom. So the slave master connived with his foot soldiers. You notice he said Hausa troops. Of course, if you doubt what we're saying, if you conduct additional research, you will see where the slave master told them to use the Hausas as soldiers. That's what they are good in. They were not being captured. They were not being sold as slaves. So anyone you see captured from that area was a Negro, not a Hausa. Hausas are not Negroes. They may be dark skinned, which the slave master referred to as Negroid but they are not negroes so our interest here is to show you that these same hausa people and hausa army was the same nigerian army as you would imagine that was the slave hunting terror group they were always working with the slave masters don't worry you might be saying you are looking for bonnie and the um, calabar slave pots we shall get to those and here is the main comment we wanted to address today and it's as regards the Arab priests and how they could have been behind the slave raids. We here at the Renaissance, based on our research, do not believe the Arab priests could have been behind the slave trade because they did not have that capacity and they couldn't have. They were very few and they had no means of transportation. So they didn't have horses, they didn't have camels, they didn't have scooters, they didn't have bicycles. So it's impossible that they could have walked to at Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, walked to Badagri in Lagos, walked to Boni, walked to Calabar to sell slaves with 400 people without being mobbed. No matter how you try to convince anybody, if you look at it from basic common sense, you will see that it was impossible that they could have done it because before you can walk to those places and come back with 400 people, you must have destroyed numerous communities and villages now after that destruction it will take days for you to recover it will take you months to walk across those distances and you are human so it's impossible the reason you believe it is because you are looking at what could have transpired in the light of realities of today and that's why the slave master said the negro does not look back and forth he only looks in the present moment and does not look either back in time or in future so he lacks both foresight and hindsight that's why anybody would believe this because you didn't look at the circumstances at that time you didn't remember that the what they will call trade by bath or what, what existed at that time the priests were just doing their thing and we are going to show you how they concocted that narrative as this video progresses so this comment says there were two types of writers during the slave trade era those who never visited the slave coast and so did not know how slaves were acquired and those who not only visited and bought slaves but they also took time to study the languages and customs of both slaves and slave dealers when it comes to the bites of biafra and benin i realized you prefer the first writers and that's because they've never heard of your ancestors the arrows and how they sold millions of Igbos and Ibibios, etc., into slavery. These writers, probably not intentional, are the source of so much confusion concerning the identities of those sold into slavery. They are the ones who classified every Negro captured along the coast of Benin and Biafra as Igbos, Hebos, etc. They are also responsible for misinforming the public by claiming European vessels raided Calabar for slaves, something that obviously not true. You love quoting the authors. Now, we are going to show you that this author is most likely a Fulani, a Yoruba, or an Oyo or Dahomian or a conquered negro when a negro is conditioned he becomes more catholic than the pope you see how he's defending those that were actually the slave hunters against those who were victims now if you understand the basic biology and you know the ecosystem it's impossible for the prey to be the predator at the same time it's impossible the prey can be a prey and a different type of species will be a predator you can't have the lion eating lions. You can't have snakes eating snakes. But you can only have different species eating different species acting as prey and predator. But what these liars are trying to tell us is that it is possible for the Negro 
to be the prey and predator at the same time when he doesn't even have the strength to protect himself from the killings so you see how he has turned it around and he claims that it is the arrows that sold the millions and that these people hadn't known them now you see how funny this statement is how could the people buying the slaves not know the know those they were buying them from you see not read that again very well so you understand what they are saying he says that i realized you prefer the first writers and that's because they have never heard of your ancestors the arrows and how they sold millions of ibos and ibibios etc into slavery these writers probably not intentional are the source of so much confusion concerning the identities of those sold into slavery now you see how he twisted it you will think he is making some sense if you don't look at the context in detail now he is saying it is them that classified all the slaves as Igbos. So we will show you where he contradicted himself still. Let's just look at all the comments before we respond. So here he listed what the author claimed they paid for one Negro slave in Bonnie in 1801. He said they paid for one Negro slave. Note this very well. Our interest is for you to see how they reason. You will very easily see who the foot soldiers are. He has masqueraded himself as somebody who is interested in sharing knowledge and debating. But you are going to see who he is shortly after this video. So you see where it says they paid for a Negro man. That swarm man in 1801. One piece of chains or whatever. You can go to the wall and read the entire thing yourself. It's quite long. But that's only one source he is referencing but he believes that they were paying for the slaves and the total article cost 25 pounds so ideally your question will become here who did they give this how many slaves did they buy so if they bought 20 slaves at that time they will be giving or paying these things in 20 portions but let's leave that until we finish the comment in a nutshell Further, he says, notice a Negro cost two muskets, that's rifles. As for the number sold within a 20-year period, it is calculated that no fewer than 16,000 of these people alone were annually exported from Bonny within the 20 years ending in 1820, so that including 50,000 taken within the same period from new and old Calabar, the aggregate export of Igbos alone was not short of 370,000. Now, he will be so happy with this figure, but remember the issue here is who was behind it. He is debating and arguing the fact that it was not the Fulanese. But our interest is to show him that first, it was not a trade. It was a hunt, raid, massacre and capture. There is no trade in it. What they do is what they do today in oil and gas, which we shall look at when we get to the end of his comments. He says further down, you see where he contradicted himself too. He says, now, I don't believe the slave raiders at Boni and Calabar received 740,000 guns during the 20 years period, but they did receive a lot of guns. But where did some of the guns go? In the geographical description of the Sudan, which was given to Clapperton in 1827 by Bello, the Fulani Sultan of Sokoto, there is the following passage. Now, ask yourself, if the Sultan of Sokoto has nothing to do with the region, what will it be doing in this context? How did it get here? Now, you will never see the Arab priests in anywhere outside their altar or their shrine or their place of worship or their synagogue or whatever you choose to call it. So, but then they know nothing about these other places. Now, slaves were being sold from Elmina. Boronu was the biggest slave mart at that time, but still they are blaming the priests. You see why? Because there was no port, no seaport in Boronu and the slaves were obviously shipped from Calabar and Boni. They now want to blame somewhere else, someone else. Because if there was a seaport in Borno, there won't be any need for them to export the slaves through uh, Badagri or Boni and Calabar. And remember at that time, Lagos and Badagri were not part of Nigeria. They were still part of Ghana, the Gold Coast as they were called. The Lagos became part of Nigeria or Southern Nigeria in 1907. So you see again, this will make his arguments collapse 
unless you don't apply common sense to their narrative you see that they are just a bunch of liars so further down here he says the word Igbo meant slave among the Igalas, the Asabas, the Robos and it was once considered an insult to call an Arrow man an Igbo and that's because he also considered the word to mean slave. The only people who did not consider the name Igbo derogatory and were happy to be identified by the name Igbo were those living in the hinterland. Now we ask you without even going to any research this should show you clearly that this is one of the slave masters full soldiers. They think they are smart. He has come to tell us that Asabas. So he's trying to tell us that Asaba are not Igbo. You see, you see the game. That's the game of the Nigerian state. Now, remember the truth is very easy to defend. And we are going to disgrace this commenter or whoever he is with the facts so that you see where they are coming from. That's why you see in Nigeria today, they will always tell you that South South is not Igbo. Meanwhile, before this was one whole eastern region, they also described who the Negroes were at that time. So just to tell you what we read earlier, remember if he is a Negro actually, the Negro has no sympathy for other Negroes. He will ally himself with the oppressor, which is what this commenter is doing. If you notice, you see how he has carefully made it look like it is only what they chose to call Southeast that are Igbos. But the facts will disgrace him shortly, which we are going to show you, so you understand what we are talking about. Now, this has shown you where his interest is. The arrow. Who are the arrow? Where, do they, where are they today? Meanwhile, the Nigerian army that was the slave-hunting terror group is still there today. And that's our enough proof of who was behind it. For now, we shall provide you with the facts shortly. So further, you see where he says, please, the event in book you quoted where the author claimed the Mohammedans guarded the slave coast happened after 1840. The Fulanese had already conquered the Jukuns by this time. Finally, please stop saying old Arab priests couldn't have sold slaves. Are there no young men in Arochuku? Also stop with we, the Negroes versus them, the Fulanese, the Yorubas and the Europeans. Negroes did sell Negroes. So now you see the thing. First, if this person is a Negro, you see that he is against his own people. He is claiming that it is his own people that sold themselves. Then if he is not, that tells you who he is. So you notice his defense. He is defending the slave masters. He is defending the slave hunters of old, which we are going to use the facts here to show you that he is a liar. This is a clear as day. So we don't need to go too far. We had addressed all this in the videos. He is saying we said. You are looking at the books, but you are blaming us for what the books are saying. So, now that we have seen his comments, let us reference the making of Northern Nigeria by Captain C.W.J. Orr. And it was published in 1911. Note that this is a military man who was based in the north. And there, we are told the following. The land proclamation made the acquisition of land by a non-native from a native illegal without the consent in writing of the high commissioner the slavery proclamation was dis directed principally against the enslaving of any person as regards domestic slavery it abolished the legal status and declared all children born after april 1 1901 to be free note this very well this should tell you ideally that they were in control because you can't make a proclamation if you don't have control over that thing. For example, you saw that Lincoln proclaimed that by 1863 that the slaves would be free and that's how the slave trade ended and they, something happened to him as well. So now they are telling us that by after April 1, people will be free. This user is telling us that they are also the slaves. Let us show you what they said next after this. From this same book, you can pick the book and read it yourself. Study it. Don't just read it. Study it. Because they don't have the wisdom and intellect for what they are saying. So they always pick from whatever they have and then turn it around on its head. That's how they play their game. If you notice, they told us that Nigeria was amalgamated in 1914 and that Flora Shaw named that amalgam as Nigeria and coined the name from River Niger, which we all know is a lie today. So here we see that in the spring of 1901, Sir Frederick Lugard proceeded home on leave of absence. 
Note this very well. Mr. William Wallace, assuming administrative charge of the protectorate until his return in the autumn. The same year, a second contingent of troops between 600 and 700 strong was sent from the protectorate to the Ashanti War, leaving in April and returning in October. In the later month, a contingent 300 strong was further sent to southern Nigeria to assist in an expedition against the Aro tribes in that protectorate. This being the third occasion within two years on which northern Nigeria who called, was called upon to provide a contingent for operations outside the protectorate. Now, there was no army anywhere in southern Nigeria. There was no army, organized army in any Negro society. Negroes never had a standing army. So now, you see how they raided the Arrow, 1901. The slave trade had ended by 1900 and they said anyone born by April in 1901 will be born free. That's how they put it. But again, we shall continue to show you how and who was behind the slave raid and slave hunts. It was the Nigerian army, which we know is there today. Now, if you say it is not, can you show us where the army used by the arrows were or where it disappeared to? You can't tell us that this one day raid that they went to do in 1901 ended and closed the chapter of the troops. The reason you believe this nonsense is because you think it was a cell. It was never a cell. The cell was happening in Europe and America and Asia. They did hunt, raid and capture in Negro land and Guinea. If you doubt what we're saying, conduct your research. We're going to use this comment to show you how those people reason. You see how he has turned it around to tell us who was saying what and how it was the arrow that could have sold. You see, when they say sell, you think it's a sell, but we're going to show you the raids and razias. And from the same book, you see where it says uh, the abolition of slave raiding. Note very well, slave raiding. It didn't say trading because there is no trading in what you call sub Saharan Africa. It was raiding, hunt, raid, and capture because at that time the Negroes were not considered human. And it goes further to say, and inter tribal warfare was therefore the first duty that devolved on the new administration. But this meant nothing more nor less than a military occupation of the entire country. For it was idle to suppose that peace could be achieved from a distance by a mere decree without a force on the spot strong enough to impose it. You see, he needed force to stop it. So now, if he was just selling, we want you to ask yourself this simple question. If you're a man or a woman, how can someone else sell you without guns weapons it was the army the nigerian army which we challenge you to research the evidence is right in front of us which we shall continue to show you so it goes further to say nothing but fierce opposition to the policy to a policy which prohibited slave raiding not slave raiding could be expected from the mohammedan states so that's the muslim states because that was their only job whose entire social organization depended on a sufficient supply of slaves and whose so-called wars provided them with their main source of income. So now we challenge you if you claim that the arrow ever sold slaves, show us any book, journal, magazine or recorded material that predates 1950 that said anything like that directly where we can see it. So he goes further to say, and whose so-called wars provided them with their main source of income. Note that he said so-called wars. So if you notice, Professor Gates, who you know is a controlled scholar, will always tell you that they will make wars. How can the Arab priests without guns and bombs fight or make wars? And if you look at the area today, you will see that it is very small. There is no way because the number of communities destroyed in the raids cannot accommodate this same number. They are talking about which we are going to show you don't worry so he goes further to say that can a cat give up mountain this is what one of the emirs was asking when he was asked to stop this thing they are doing now remember the houses were not being sold the houses are not negroes you need to understand this very well and therein he shows everywhere clearly who was behind the raids so he goes further now 
to also tell us that this was the reply of the slave raiding emir of Contagora when informed that under the British regime, slave raiding must cease. When I die, it will be with a slave in my mouth. Now remember, this was something they did with a lot of pride. So we are going to read further for context and for the sake of this discourse. It says, the pagan tribes might be expected to welcome a power which promised them their immunity from the slave raids which had devastated their countries for centuries but they formed only a portion of the area to be administered. As events turned out, moreover, these pagan tribes proved even more troublesome than the Mohammedan states for their suspicions of the new conquering power were difficult to remove and for reasons which will presently be given, they did not appreciate the new anti-slavery policy as warmly as might have been expected. Now get this very well, the Arrows were pagans, the Negroes in the south were pagans. So they are telling us that the pagans were also raiding pagans, the Mohammedans were raiding pagans because they are pagans. The Christians are submitted and supported it because they were pagans and then the pagans were also raiding themselves. For what reason now? When they also were suspecting the new conquering power who they expected would free them. Read this very well for the sake of context and this discourse. You need to read it very well and understand what it is saying. Now this user is telling us that no, that the priests were raiding the slaves because when a lie is told often enough, it begins to look like the truth. We are going to debunk it. Just all you need to do is read the accounts of those people. You will understand that it's a lie. Let us also reference travels and discoveries in North and Central Africa being a journal of an expedition undertaken under the auspices of His Britannic Majesty's government in the years 1849 to 1855 by Henry Bath, PhD and is in five volumes, volume 2, second edition and it was published in 1857 and there we see the following. Ibo, dwelling in nine villages on the black water back in Rua, as many of the Hausa people called the Quara, although the Ibo and other tribes in that district give the name Blackwater in general to the Benue, while they distinguish the Quara as the White Water. The Igbo, whom as well as the Ding Ding, the Fubi believe to be Christians, have neither cattle, horses, nor asses, but plenty of large sheep, goats, swine, and poultry. The expedition which my informant accompanied in 1848-9 to spent two months in this country plundering it and carrying away a great many slaves. Since that time, the Fubi can in some respects truly say that their empire extends as far as the sea. So now if you say it wasn't the Fulani that captured and sold the Ibos, tell us who did. All you need to do is to show us at least this expedition spent two months. This is only one instance, so we're not talking of all the instances. Tell us what will be spending two months other than an army, which they had. In their numbers, it was the slave hunting terror group that was renamed Nigerian Army in 1863 and we are going to show you again how the ally of how they were formed by a British naval officer in 1863 collapses. We are going to show you that shortly. Let us reference history of the Liverpool privateers and letter of Mark with an account of the Liverpool slave trade by Goma Williams and it was published 1897 and there we are told that the abolitionists, however, maintained that what the slave traders called war was nothing else but pillage, robbery, and kidnapping of the most wanton, cruel, and sordid character. Now, reference the previous material we read about what so-called war, how the author put it there as well, so-called war. So when they tell you war, it's not actually a war, it's a razia or slave raid, which in terms of the Islamic system of Takia, they are telling you the way you won't understand what they are saying unless you read between the lines. Take note of this, research it yourself. So it goes further to say that when slave ships arrived on the coast, the petty princes of the country sent out their Mohammedans in parties of from 300 to 3,000. Now, he is telling us that it was because those that were buying before didn't know about the arrows that that's why you see how subtle these people are 
they can lie that is you will be holding them there you are seeing them doing that thing they are still lying that's who they are so you see how he changed it now if not that we have these books to reference if you were listening to him on the let's say slave masters channels because they are foot soldiers to the slave masters you would think he has a case you see how he said it was those that didn't know about the arrows meanwhile it was the same people that he claimed didn't know the arrows that must have bought the slaves were the arrows selling the slaves to people that they didn't know assuming but without conceding they were selling the slaves to empty water they just throw them into the water and the other people will carry them are they not human where were they the slaves were shipped to elmina castle that's where they were shipped from because the slave ports if you notice there are mansions in the cape coast castle or elmina castle but there is nothing built in the slave port in bonnie and calabar that's because that's where they were being captured from the ships take them to elmina for storage after capture that's what they were doing now you're telling us that a man a priest will walk around look at how he put it that there were young men that were doing it we have the army physically as our evidence today show us where the slave hunting terror group of the arrows disappeared to we will show you the origin of your nigerian army as a fulani and islamic slave hunting terror group renamed nigerian army in 1863 you can see when they celebrated their 150 years of that rebirth in 2013 what more argument do you need or do you have to defend this thing so you see where it says when slave ships arrived on the coast the petty princes of the country sent out their myamidons in parties of from 300 to 3000 at least the arrow didn't have a standing army often on horseback the arrow didn't have horses we had read it in previous one that author holds or holds a phd so before you say he didn't know what he was writing you can go and get your own phd first so he goes further to say that to attack and burn towns and villages in the dead of night so that the panic stricken inhabitants were the more easily seized and bound while attempting to save themselves and those most there to them from the flames every man woman and child that could be secured by this armed banditti were carried off without mercy the men stripped quite naked and chained together the women and children lose in this manner they were all driven by their own countrymen assisted sometimes by europeans towards the place of sale like sheep for the slaughter the distance to be traveled before they reached the coast being often two or three hundred miles now you are telling us that the arab priests will do this get two or three hundred miles and then walk back that should tell you clearly and now just to give you an idea these negroes were being pushed down you see how the fulani came up today to say oh the chad is drying because of the slave masters uh, new gimmick of uh, global warming that they're now moving their cows southwards is the same thing they are doing which we shall continue to show you now you see how this man is defending them now tell him to explain to us why the nigerian army does not stop fulani herdsmen does not arrest them let him go and show us the fulani that is serving life imprisonment or that has been killed by firing squad in this whole nonsense of the nigerian project we will start from there so it goes further to say that thus the dearest relatives were torn from each other's arms in all probability never more to meet on earth even children were separated from their parents except the suckling infants who were permitted for obvious reasons to accompany the mother what a moving scene exclaims Clarkson. parents and children husbands and wives brothers and sisters not only forced from their native country but denied in their exile and captivity the small consolation of mingling their sides and tears in mutual consolence and commiseration such a scene must exceed the powers of language to express or of the human mind whatever but our interest is for you to see why the abuse is saying oh it's the arrow it's the arrow and unfortunately like we told you when an idea gets into the brains of a negro to eradicate it can only be by cutting the head off so this was what people were taught in primary schools so that from childhood 
they believe it's the arrow. If you doubt us, if you meet a Negro professor today, he will tell you the same thing. He will tell you that, oh, it was the arrow priest that sold it. Now we ask you, you that is listening to this, you are obviously more than 18 years. Can you explain to us how somebody can sell you? However you want to explain it without military force. Now, the reason they were able to capture them is because it was an army. They were captured and yoked. If they were not yoked, they killed themselves. So how then will any sensible person stop around to say it was the Negro selling themselves? This is not correct. We will continue to show you and we challenge you to show us how possible it is that they could have sold themselves. So please notice how this comment tried to twist it and said, oh, they got guns. They got this number of guns, but he doesn't know where they disappeared to. Now look at the date he's talking about and when they could have gotten the guns. Remember in our last video in part three of the slave hunters alibi, we did show you that they brought one gun and a lot of garbage for 200 slaves, which you can go to that material and study it yourself. Now, this one is giving you how much they paid for one slave. This is what they claimed to have paid. But this other one said he came with a gun and some trifles, which was agreed. And he saw 200 people sitting in a place secluded. That's how the slave raids were done. It was never a sell. It was hunt, raid and capture. And those that did it know themselves. And going further, it says, of course, human mind conceived were not felt or seen. When, as sometimes happened, native princes objected to pillage their subjects and sell their countrymen into bondage, the traders kept them in a state of intoxication till their end was attained. So you see, there is no way they could have done it. The priests couldn't have done this. You see it clearly. They say when the priests objected, and remember, when the king of Benin, whoever he was, objected to slaves passing through his kingdom, his foot soldiers, which we saw the houses were in part of the army and the British troops raided and of course they banished him from his kingdom. This is captured better in a different place but just for us to focus and show this person that their lies are being exposed. No lie lives forever. They have lied so much against these priests. The lies were sustained by the slave masters because that was the easiest way to sell christianity they were able to convince them that oh no it was the false gods you're worshiping that made the wars that's the razias and the slave race to come upon you if you started worshiping these our gods that's how it will stop that's how they got the negroes to convert to christianity if you doubt what we're saying conduct your research so you don't think uh, we're just saying if you also doubt how they converted them to Islam, we also will show you. We show you why they are doing what they are doing now because these things are well documented. So it goes further to say, Some noted traders were a terror to the country for they openly and avowedly kidnapped their brethren whom they carried off, gagged, lest their cries should alarm the country as they passed. This method was called panniering and no question were asked by the slave captains whose business was to make up their cargoes speedily. The slave ships occasionally expedited this desirable object by capturing canoes at sea and along the coast. They also decoyed the native on board on pretense of traffic, seized them and put them in irons. Another dastardly method was to make some leading native drunk, get him to sell some of his relatives whom he redeemed when sober at any price insisted upon by the slave captains or their agents. A son sold his father who was a slave owner and he had to give 20 slaves to redeem him. A trader returning from a ship with the proceeds of four slaves he had just sold at a high price was seized by a native chief, taken to the vessel and sold, thus becoming the companion in misery of those over whom he had a short time before held the power of life and death. Now, if you read these things between the line and read a lot of materials, don't just read one like this commenter is trying to do, telling us that it was the arrows. When we're seeing the Fulani is doing the same thing today. Now, if you read what he wrote here, you would think that, oh, a son just woke up and sold his father. They tried to symbolically suggest that this is what you did. So if you notice, they say they put them under intoxication and then say they did. 
so imagine where somebody is drunk and you say oh you have you sold your father he agrees now remember in all cases that these negroes are human they made it look like the negroes were cattle and if you imagine how your son would say oh i've sold you daddy and you start walking and following them you see that it's impossible and doesn't make sense so at that time they convinced the whole world that the negroes were beasts lower than cattle they lived on trees they didn't wear clothes that's why if you saw the earlier page before this you saw that the moment they were captured they were stripped naked that's the game they tried to make everybody see them as animals they were not because people were against the trade so some of these lies you will see if you apply common sense to it you will understand that it's impossible you say son was sold the father so when the man was drunk and you say you have bought his father how did you negotiate the price so they just look for an excuse if you doubt what we're saying just look at nigeria today look at the fulani look at cameroon they just need to find an excuse to attack a community they can come and say oh one of our cattle was killed that's who they are that's just who they are they can wake up and say oh what happened was because so so and so person said this at that time the reason was because they were pagans and according to them sheikh Otman dan Fodio told them that allah had given them the whole places and that they must fight to get them which we know is a lie because allah is an arab god there is no way he can come and give other people the land of those who do not even know him or it or whatever it is so again that should tell you again that there is no way the arab priests could have done it and for the sake of knowledge here is a copy of account sales of negroes from a slave ship called african now this author or this comment does not tell us when the place started or being being known as african it doesn't tell us who was captured and who was not now remember the houses were not being sold because they were not considered negroes but negroes that lived within them could be captured and sold which we can show you if we still have enough time on this video so it goes it tells us that sales of 268 negroes slaves imported in the ship african captain thomas trader from malemba on the account and the risk of messiah's john cole and co owners of the said ship merchants in liverpool now if you look at it very well you are going to say oh it's actually a sale but it's a sale when the slaves have been captured seasoned and then presented at the slave market which is like your stock exchange today in europe america and asia that's how it is done so all they needed was the fools in sub-saharan africa to help them capture the slaves which is what they are still doing to today if you notice their weapons cannot be bought by anyone else because the rest of the world manufactured theirs it's still only in sub-saharan africa where the fools live so if you check the nigerian army you see sometimes they show you that they have manufactured cars armored cars now we want you to tell us how possible it is that the nigerian army was protecting nigeria from ghana and the ghanaian army was protecting ghana from nigeria and nigerian army was also protecting nigeria from cameroon from ivory coast from all those countries around there so again you see that that whole thing is a charade that same nigerian army has never fought a war outside nigeria it only fights women and children which we challenge you to investigate all they do is to claim that oh you shot at us and they started shooting them if they want to wipe out the community all you will hear is they can come and shoot one or two people accuse the one community or one person there as being behind it and then come and raise the whole place the same thing they did during the slave trade which we are going to continue to show you so that this author this person whoever made this comment will know where the truth lies and where his lies are coming from you can't live a lie forever it's time to start saying the truth it might not be what you want to hear but the truth has to still be told and here we come to the end of this edition of the negro his own greatest enemy path one we thank you very much for listening and we encourage you to find time to conduct your own research we shall continue to debunk this comment in the next path of this series thank you very much for listening peace